Profiling and benchmarking. Today we are going to talk about why this is important, how to do it, and some common measures that we can use for profiling physical attributes of athletes. We're not going to get into the sport specific profiling and benchmarking, that's more for the sport coach to tackle or you in conjunction with the sport coach. What's up my man, welcome to class. <laughs> Uh, but we will talk about those ones that we can do in the weight room as sports scientists, okay? So we're gonna start with definitions, like always, to make sure that we have, we're operating under the same uh, understanding of these terms. Then we'll talk about establishing performance norms and then some common performance benchmarks that we can be using both as strength coaches and as sports scientists. All right, so first of all, performance norms, what are they? You should know this from your reading this week. Uh, they are established normative levels of performance based on large samples from a population similar to that being tested, okay? And the second part of this is especially important. Large samples, not small samples, uh, similar to the population being tested. So if you are working with a group of youth soccer athletes, youth female soccer athletes, we probably shouldn't be looking at norms that were established in college age males. Okay, there's a difference. We're gonna see uh, a table here in a second uh, with some of those differences. Um, so example here could be average jump height by age, sex, and sport, separate, uh, separated. We can find that in the literature, we can find that sometimes in the coaching manuals, sometimes we have to compile it ourselves. Now working from a performance norm, remember which is more of an average of a sample, a benchmark then is a comparison of an athlete's performance on a specific test against a standard based on factors such as age, maturation, playing position, and training history. All right, we get these standards though from the performance norms. So we can't really create benchmarks until we have an idea of what is normal for athletes to score on these tests. Okay, we can't just make up the benchmarks out of thin air. Well, I want all my athletes to jump 50 inches, right? Well, that's unreasonable, and if you said that, most likely you haven't looked at performance norms for the athletes that you're working with yet. Example, a team's performance standards for, let's say, vertical jump, which are based on the norms for that sample, all right? Here's an example uh, from the NSCA. This is in the Essentials of Strength and Conditioning textbook. These are performance norms for a variety of different uh, types of athletes, soccer players, hockey players, what else we have, wrestling, weightlifting, men and women, different age groups, and then you can see uh, vertical jump, static jump, and broad jump uh, vertical jump obviously is the most commonly tested here, um, but these are performance norms. Now take a look at the samples though, number of athletes in the second column there, 51, 83, 79, like that's, that's enough, that's a big enough sample, 265, that's great, but some of these smaller ones, like for these soccer teams, 21, 20, 21, 18, uh, this is maybe borderline too small to really have much value as far as inferring those um, uh, these norms to another team. And if you also will notice, if we look at the actual vertical jump numbers, some of them are pretty low, right? So like these are like national uh, teams, right? Women jumping 13-5, 11-4 for the under 17 soccer team. Uh, Division one soccer in Spain, 10.3 inches. Like that's not that high, right? But it also, it also matters how we've collected this data. If you're collecting the data on a jump mat versus on force plates, the jump mat's gonna give you higher values every time. If you're collecting it um, with some sort of, um, you know, a wall test, like a, like a stand and reach and then like you slap the wall, that has a lot of inherent error in it. So I don't know how these were, were uh, collected. You could go, we could go back and look at the literature uh, that reported them, but we have to take all those things into account when we're looking at performance norms. Now, uh, going forward more, profiling. Profiling, now we're gonna start to talk about the individual athlete, whereas performance norms and benchmarks deal more at the team level. Profiling can deal with the team, but also with individual athletes. This is a method of quantifying the physical, psychological, technical, and tactical aspects of an athlete, of a team, an event, or a sport. So it's kind of like the um, needs analysis that we've talked about before, and you probably learned about studying for the CSCS but we are extrapolating it, not just for the sport, but for the athlete or the team as well. Effective profiling accounts for both athlete and sport-specific context. 
such as position, age group, maturation, sex, level of competition, and individual differences. So as an example of a way to, um, to visually display an athlete's profile, we could show a radar plot comparing performance testing results against established benchmarks. Okay, so we need those benchmarks before we create the profile or else we have no real idea of whether or not these, um, the profile is good or bad. What are the strengths or the weaknesses? Well, we compare them to the benchmarks that we established by looking at performance norms. And then we also have ranking. This is another way of comparing athletes or quantifying uh, their effectiveness in different categories. Uh, the same categories, physical, psychological, tactical, and technical. So a ranking is a method of intra or inter-athlete comparison. So you can compare an athlete against other athletes or that athlete to themselves over time. Um, and it sorts test or performance scores ordinally, right? It doesn't, you don't always know the difference between first place and second place and second place and third place, only that they are ordered by first, second, and third. That's what ordinally means. It sorts them ordinarily from best to worst, and it can be used to compare athletes to each other or over time. An example would be the Husker Power Performance Index developed by uh, Boyd Epley. Now this one does quantify, so it's not ordinal. Um, you do know the difference uh, between, let's say, first and second, and so on down the line, because there's a number associated with it. Here's an example of a radar plot, also called a spider graph. And we can see, uh, this is from the text, uh, different categories, different fitness characteristics, flexibility, endurance, agility, strength, so on. And most likely there was either a te one test for each of these or perhaps a series of tests that they then combined into a single score to plot it on this radar plot. Obviously 20 meter sprint, that's gonna be like one test. But strength could be a, um, multiple components. It could be one RM strength, it could be isometric mid-thigh pull, peak force combined into a single metric that they call strength. Or it could just be one test, all right? There's a lot of ways to skin the cat. But what we can see here is that we're comparing the athlete in blue to the team average in red um, to the desired benchmark. So we've set these aspirational benchmarks in green and that's where we want the athlete uh, to reach. So we can tell already anaerobic power and strength and 20 meter sprint, they're pretty good. They're getting very close to those benchmarks. Repeated sprint ability is almost there. It looks like their immune response, maybe they're dealing with some things there, maybe they're overstressed or overworked, underslept, underrecovered, and their endurance is crap. <laughs> so they need to work on that. Um, and yeah, and they're pretty decent on flexibility. So we can start to uh, put this athlete into a certain archetype, a certain bin. Um, we can start to characterize them, we can start to guide their training. These are very informative. This is an example that we developed here um, with some of our master's students last year. This was from a, a battery of tests that we, um, we conducted with some youth athletes, local youth athletes, and we put them through a series of tests and we came up with this profile, uh, which we essentially took, it was well over 100 variables because we had physical therapists there, we had us as a sports scientist, we had their strength and conditioning coaches, and it was like a full day of testing. And we essentially honed in on several of these aspects that we thought were most relevant to them as these developing youth athletes. And you can see those here, but then we compiled them all into these nice radar plots for them. And I think for them, between the radar plot and then the, just the little bar graphs, this is reminiscent of like what you might see in like a video game where you're like choosing your character, you know, and there's just these different uh, bars, like, oh, I want that one who has like better power or better health or whatever. Like, Kids understand that, and so that's why we displayed it this way. We always wanna go for something that the receiving party understands, okay? If you're delivering to a data scientist, that's one thing. If you're delivering it to a coach, that's another thing. You're delivering it to an athlete, that's another thing, and depending on their age as well. So delivering this to a 13-year-old, we wanted them to be able to understand it. All right, and I mentioned the Husker Power Performance Index. Um, this, is, this is a paper that sort of details aspects of it. Really interesting about the rise of the strength and conditioning profession uh, from just this whole era in the 50s and 60s where most sport coaches thought, oh, weight training makes you slow, it makes you bulky, it's not athletic. And uh, Boyd Epley was one of the first to start to organize this group of individuals into an actual profession. 
and to really show the world that um, no, making athletes bigger, stronger, and faster is beneficial to the game, and it started in American football. So this, uh, the Husker Power Performance Index was comprised of the vertical jump, a pro agility, and a 10-yard dash, or at least that's how it's, how it's run today. I'm not sure the original um, <laughs> tests that go into it. And then a fourth sports-specific test. And then he, he along with another uh, professor at the university where he was coaching, they put together this algorithm that takes into account world records and other research and more than 30 years now of testing data. So they've established these benchmarks and bound it all up into this algorithm where you can input the results of these tests and then it ranks the athletes basically based on how close they are to these records, how high above the norms that they are that they've had for more than 30 years, and through research establishing which of these is the most important for performance in any given sport. All right, so how do we establish these performance norms? Let's say that we're starting from ground zero as a strength coach. You get hired um, by you know, fill in the blank professional sports team. They have a strength and conditioning staff, they have a coaching staff, but they're going to rely on you to establish performance norms for them. What are the benchmarks that our athletes should be hitting and what are those benchmarks based on? And here's the flow, here's the list of what we need to do, right? First, everything starts with a, with a complete needs analysis, whether you're creating a performance norm, whether you are creating a training program, whether you're creating a monitoring program, it always starts with the needs analysis. If you ever run into a question like that on the test, where like, what are the steps for fill in the blank? The first step is always needs analysis. From there, we go to the literature. What has been published? That table that I showed you guys earlier is a great place to start. Um, when, we, when we say literature, that doesn't always mean go straight for the, um, you know, to PubMed or to Google Scholar. Remember that textbooks are a great resource. Textbooks are like, um, like a giant lit review, right? That's written in a way that's easy to understand and you, you can mine through those references very effectively. Look for the tables that list all the references. And from there, then you look up those studies and you read them. We also want to establish in-house performance norms to ensure that uh, the validity of our data and to make sure that our benchmarks are realistic. Okay, you might go into the literature and you might find Oh, hey, you know, everybody's jumping between 40 and 50 centimeters on their vertical jump, their no hand vertical jump in this sport, but maybe your athletes are consistently under that. Why is that? Is it the way that your coach is recruiting? Is it something in particular about the way that they're being trained? And if so, maybe you need to adjust your benchmarks just a little bit to be realistic to the population you are working with. We want to consider maturation and long-term development. So what's the age of the athletes, but also what's the training age? How much experience do they have previously as they come into the program? Adequate sample size. Of course, we don't want to base anything on very small samples. And if they are small samples, then we take that with a grain of salt. And then with these performance norms and the benchmarks that we establish, once testing is complete, we always compare those results back to the norms um, or to the benchmarks that are based on the norms, okay? So we don't, we don't ever wanna just collect data for the sake of collecting data. And I'll say that again and again, probably every lecture, we always compare it back. It's always a loop. We always have to close the loop, all right? A key point that I said earlier, but I'll stress again, because it's important. Sports scientist, that's you, may not be sure under what conditions information was generated, whether you read it in the literature or in a textbook or you see it posted on Twitter or you know, whatever it is. Ideally, these data, uh, performance norms, should be obtained from a similar, a similar population to ensure that the characteristics of the group being tested are similar, all right? As, as similar as possible between your group and the performance norm, and if possible, figure out exactly how that data was collected. That's, that's why in our, um, lab assignments, our methods and report assignments, I'm asking you guys a little bit, uh, I'm asking a little bit more of you each week to build out those methods that you're writing up for how you collected the data because it's so important to understand how to read methods and how to keep track of your methods for how you conduct your testing. Okay, so what are some common benchmarks and ratios that we can use in the weight room as sports scientists and as strength and conditioning professionals? We're just gonna cover a few, just a few of the big ones, and I'm sure there will be some that you guys can think of or have used that are not gonna be in the slides, but these are enough to get you guys started and enough to really run 
uh, just about any program off of. All right, the first has to do with the isometric mid-thigh pull, but we can extrapolate this to other isometric tests, maybe like an iso squat or an iso half squat. And this is just dealing with peak force. There are other, there are other metrics, of course, that we, we might look at. Um, but some of the most commonly um, identified benchmarks in for peak force in the IMTP is 5,000 newtons for males, and this is usually including their body mass. Of course, then if you get like a real hefty guy in there, that's gonna make it a little easier for him to hit 5,000, so you could choose to go 5,000 after body mass is subtracted, or 3,500 for females, okay? Another common one is five times body weight for males and four times body weight for females. All right, so an absolute benchmark and a relative benchmark. And of course, for your population, your sample, uh, it might be different. For your sport, it might be different. I've seen females pull over 6,000 newtons, right? And I've seen whole teams of males who could barely pull 2,000 newtons. So it's gonna be different. Another common one regarding strength is your uh, strength to body mass ratio, particularly with the back squat. That's something that's thrown around a lot. Of course, we want to consider, are we working with, let's say, a, weight, a team of weightlifters? Or what if our team is a team of basketball players who are all like seven foot, right? The, the back squat might not be the best way to test their strength because they've got to squat down about a mile before they hit depth, right? So this is from work, uh, I forgot to put the citation up here. This is work done by Sukumel et al. I believe it was um, The Importance of Muscular Strength was the title of this, part one. Um, great graph showing the um, the theoretical relationship between back squat strength and improved sport performance. Okay, notice that there's sort of three columns here. On the very left, you see the strength deficit zone. This is where your lack of strength as an athlete directly impedes your ability to perform as an athlete. You just don't have that ability to produce a lot of force, so your ability to accelerate and decelerate and change directions and jump very high will all be hindered. But as you increase in your ability to to move a lot of weight, to produce force relative to your body mass into this middle uh, section, that's the strength association phase. And this is where increases in strength actually have not a one-to-one -one correlation, but we can see direct evidence of improvements in physical, physical capacities that matter for sport. Sprint times, agility times, jump heights, those types of things. Once you get to the strength reserve, this is where we, uh, the strength actually starts to plateau, the benefits of strength into sport performance. The transfer of training is not quite as great as it was in that strength association phase. And so any gains we make in strength have marginal improvements in performance, all right? So the saying stronger is always better, while I still think it's true <laughs> if, if in a nuanced sense, we, it might be better to put our energy somewhere else once our athletes get to two times body weight in the back squat or higher. And of course, like with everything else, context is important. For a football player, probably over two times body weight is still gonna be in that strength association phase. In a figure skater, maybe it's less than two times body weight. Another common one is eccentric hamstring, uh, hamstring strength. We have a Nord board here in the lab, we've been using it. Uh, the literature on this is still developing. A lot has been done in the last five to 10 years. Um, in checking into it this week, some numbers that I found, uh, levels below 250 um, to 340 newtons, roughly, may increase risk of injury to the hamstrings, hamstring strain during high velocity sprinting. More work still has to be done to really get good nuanced recommendations. Another study came out with um, uh, more of an equation. So eccentric hamstring strength equals four times body weight plus 26. Um, so ideally you should be able to do uh, four times your body weight, which seems like a lot to me. All right, moving on to power benchmarks. So this is a vertical jump and associated characteristics. Of course we have jump height, but there's also some other jump characteristics we can look at. Takeoff velocity, time to takeoff, 
RSI is one of them that we're going to talk about on its own. Um, mean or peak concentric power, you'll see often reported. And then scaled mean or peak concentric power. If you have a larger individual, um, you know, they, they might be able to produce a lot of absolute power, but how much can they produce scaled to their body mass? Jump height is nice because it's almost like, um, it's almost a way to automatically scale it to body mass because of gravity, right? If you have a larger individual, um, they will not jump as high with the same power output as a lighter individual. All right, now we're getting into some of these ratios. Uh, these were all mentioned in the text. And there's three of them to talk about. The words sound really cool and sciencey, uh, but in reality, they're pretty simple, but they're, but they're very useful for programming. The first is the dynamic strength index. This is a ratio to how much uh, force you can produce isometrically versus dynamically. So if we put our athletes through the isometric mid-thigh pull and a vertical jump test on force plates, we can capture the peak force that they produce in each of those movements. One of them is, is isometric, the IMTP, and the other is dynamic, the vertical jump. If we look at that ratio, it's essentially telling us how much of their actual strength can they recruit during a dynamic movement. If that number, if that ratio is greater than 0.8, that means that they can use a lot of their strength during that dynamic movement. Maybe we could, we could focus on strength training, basic strength training, to get their peak strength up, because maybe that's going to pull along their dynamic ability as well. If it's less than 0.6, that means they can't use a lot of the strength that they have. They can express all of that strength isometrically, but they're not using it to get up in the vertical jump. So maybe we should focus on power training, and that will have a better transfer of training effect into their actual sporting movements. Yeah, does that make sense? Questions there? No? You guys are all tracking? The next is the reactive strength index. This is actually data from one of my colleagues, Tim Sukumel, and, and other colleagues who I forget are on the paper. <laughs> um, I trained this team and the men's tennis team right there, so forgive me for not getting their reactive strength index very high, but you'll see on the next tab, they, they were pretty strong. Um, so the reactive strength index is a ratio of jump height to ground contact time or flight time to ground contact time, which are perfectly correlated, um, or near perfectly correlated, or jump height to time to takeoff. Now, it was developed originally using depth jumps, so stepping off of a box, contacting a jump mat or a force plate, and getting the ground contact time that way. But we can, it's been modified so that we can now use it with vertical jumps in which we use time to take off, right? The time from that downward phase of the movement um, until you reach toe off in the jump. So basically the entire counter movement, that time is time to take off. The higher you jump, the higher the RSI. The shorter your time to take off, the higher the RSI. And we can see some of the numbers here for RSI mod. This one that we use with counter movement jumps would be called RSI mod. And then we also have the eccentric utilization ratio. This is when we compare counter movement jumps to squat jumps, all right? And the difference being that in the squat jump, we obviously don't have the eccentric component because we've dissipated all of the elastic energy return from the stretch shortening cycle by pausing at the bottom of the squat jump for a full three seconds or more. And now we generate all of that power explosively to jump as high as possible. Typically, athletes should not be able to squat jump as high as they can counter movement jump. If they can, it means one of two things. Either they're just stinking strong athletes, right? Like I've seen weightlifters squat jump about as high, sometimes even higher than their counter movement jump if they have poor counter movement jump um, technique, okay? The second thing it could mean, aside from being very strong, is that maybe they just have really bad counter movement jump technique and they can't utilize their stretch shortening cycle effectively. They can't capture that energy elastically and then return it with the concentric muscle action, which is not very good if you're, if you're an athlete. It's okay if you're a strength athlete, but probably not if you're any type of uh, team sport athlete. All right, and remember how my tennis athletes have very low RSI 
here? Well, they had very high uh, eccentric utilization ratios, meaning that they were pretty strong. Like they could, they could squat jump fairly high compared to how they could uh, counter movement jump. All right, so at least they were strong. All right, the key point with all of this and to remember with all of this, um, no matter which of these tests that we use, if you could come up with a perfect battery of tests, the thing is test quality will ultimately determine how effective the process is, okay? So the quality with which you're, you're collecting that data is of utmost importance. Um, it will affect uh, that and the impact that the assessment can have. The quality of the test will have a significant impact on the validity and the reliability of the test, all right? This is why those methods are so important, to nail them down and to make sure they're standardized across everyone who might be testing the athletes. You do it the same way every single time. The athlete should know the process and you should know the process. Sophisticated methods of data analysis and interpretation cannot overcome poor test quality. Okay, so standardize, standardize, standardize. Any of these are good. Okay, some might be better than others in certain situations and with certain athletes, but the best test is the one that's valid and reliable. The one whose data you can count on. The one whose data you can make inferences from. Dr. Good is here back with another lecture.